Hey guys and gals, welcome to a new series called Discord Dilemmas. This wasn't a planned series, but it was just an idea that came to me while I was in the bathroom, and I know better than to reject a good nugget when it floats to the top of your mind. You know, those good ideas that you don't just flush away. So this series will be covering questions that come up in Discord that require a bit more explanation and are likely to be asked again. Having a series of calmly asked questions will free up some of my time as well as some other developers who have been so gracious with their own time helping others in the support channel. So thank you for doing so. Bri, that's me, as well as all the people asking the questions, really do appreciate you. Thanks again. If we can get 10 million likes on this video, that would tell me that you guys actually enjoy this content and I'll continue to make more. So the ball's in your court, and as Shang Tsung would say, choose your destiny. I think that was Shang Tsung. Is it Shang Tsung? Or maybe it was Shao Kahn. I can't remember, but I think it was in Mortal Kombat 3. Why don't you guys let me know in the comments, hmm? Okay, without further ado, hashtag what a sellout. Welcome to Discord Dilemmas Episode 1. This question was brought up by Atlas. Alice was trying to have the game mode trigger events on the player controllers to create widgets, but the player controllers would not run events that were set to run on owning client. That's because run on owning client doesn't mean run the code on the client side. I've added a PDF in the resource channel on Discord that shows a little example of how this event actually works. It can be misleading, so make sure you check out that example. It's a free resource, anyone that joins Discord has access to it, so help yourself. The goal for this scenario was to have two different screens, one during the waiting period before the game starts and the other during gameplay, so let's just get right into it. This little project will be available on GitHub, so feel free to download and play around with it as you please. Okay, Atlas, so the first thing that I did was create three different widgets instead because you know you got to have that end screen in there too brother these widgets are just a single text widget with some pretty colors and some helpful text to let the player know what's happening game before game during game end simple we don't even need to look at these anymore obviously you'd be dressing these up a lot more depending on what you wanted to show and when but this is just concept you get the idea then we've got the hud it's good practice to use this as a container that is the central point for controlling everything that ends up on the player's screen personally i like to have a different hud container per level or map whether it's my main menu or my actual game map those would have two different hud widgets since i don't want too much irrelevant logic all in one hud in the designer all three screens are in here and two of them are set to hidden and the first one we want the player to see is set to non-hit testable just as an FYI, visible as well as both non-hit testable options will still draw the UI to the screen, whereas hidden and collapsed will actually hide it. You can hover over the options to learn more, but basically non-hit testable removes it from a stack of widgets that sit there and listen for mouse input events. Setting widgets that aren't interactable to non-hit testable is actually better for performance, so make sure that you do that whenever you can. Okay, so in the event graph, we're grabbing all three screens. All three screens have been set to be a variable, so we can actually see them on the event graph. And we have to make sure our array type is of type user widget, since all widgets inherit from a user widget object, otherwise you can't add them to an array. So don't try to do this and promote one of these and turn it into an array like this because then you won't be able to add to it. You probably already know that, but for someone else that doesn't know how three different widgets are part of the same array, there you go. Make it a generic user widget array. So we've got two functions created just to spice things up. One function updates the HUD using an enum for legibility's sake, and the other updates it using an int for performance sake, sacrificing legibility, but who cares? It's only three screens. Besides, it looks much cleaner too. You can obviously have a hybrid here as well, since enums can technically be converted to bytes and ints. Just remember that this extra step right here can be eliminated completely if you just stick with ints. But honestly, it's so negligible either way you go. So pick whichever one feels right because it really doesn't matter with our technology nowadays. So let's just not even worry about it. Let's keep going. All we're doing is looping through the screens array. And if the screen we selected matches the screen index, it gets set to non-hit testable, which makes it visible. Otherwise, if it doesn't match, it's hidden. In our player controller on event begin play, we're checking to make sure that it's a local player controller, meaning this is actually a player, whether it's a host or a client doesn't matter as long as it's a human create a hud widget store it as a variable and add it to the player's viewport down here we've got two sets of events for each variation of the functions but you're only going to need two of these depending on which way you go obviously the first event is sr update screen which is set to not replicated and the other one is cl update screen which is set to run on owning client the sr update screen event calls the cl update screen event which calls the update screen function here and all that does is call the update screen on the hud that we just saw earlier 
So even though this SR event is set to not replicate it, I prefixed it with SR because I know that the game mode is the one that calls this event. And since the game mode only exists on the server, we're going to be running on the server version of the player controller. So I use that prefix just to help myself know where the logic is running when I'm quickly glancing over the code. Then the server version of the player controller will call the client version of the player controller who actually knows what a HUD is since widgets only exist on the client side. In the game mode on post login fires off anytime a player connects to your map. So we want to cast this to our controller type right off the bat so we can store it in an array of our custom controller type. This is a good practice because you don't want to iterate through this later and do a cast every single time you want to call another function on these controllers. So you're most likely going to use these controllers over and over again throughout your game. So think about potential world events where you want to communicate with the controllers, changing the UI again, server travel, or when you're having a bad day and you just want to disable input for all your players, you know, the normal things that happen in a game. It's just better to have them ready to simply call a function and not cast each time you loop through the array. So I'm simply checking to see if we've hit the max players variable. I just have this variable set to two. If so, we call the enum version of the update player widgets function. And you can see how easy it is to read with enums in this cute little drop down menu. Then we set the game to started and we call the start end game timer event. This sets another event timer for three seconds and then calls the end game delegate, which then ends up updating the player screens using the same function. And just so we have two different ways that the game can start on event begin play, we've got a three second timer that's going to force the game to start anyway, whether we have enough players or not. This time we use the int version of the function and start that same end game timer. Both of these functions simply loop through the controllers array and call the SR update screen event on the player controller. Notice how we don't have to cast anymore because we already did that once at the very beginning when the players joined. And this is good. And I'm not talking directly to you, Atlas. I'm talking to all the other magicians out there that love to cast everywhere and just want to use up all their mana. You don't have to. You just got to cast once, save it, and use it over and over again. Okay, so we've got the player count set to two and I'm playing as a listen server so we can see how this behaves on both the host and the client. And you'll notice that even though the host is always the first player to join, both the client and the host get their UI updated at the same time. This is because the game mode is a singleton. There's only one version of it in existence at once. So it's running the event on all the players at the same time, instead of each player keeping track of their own timers and game time and all that fun stuff. So we join up, we wait for players. After three seconds, we fight, fight, fight and three more seconds. And then we obviously need to Netflix and chill. Like I said before, you're going to be dressing up these screens with a lot more juiciness, but I think you get the idea. The concept is still the same. So I hope this helps you out, Atlas. And I want to thank everybody for being active and asking questions enough to get me inspired to get back off my butt and hit record again. In the meantime, I ask you guys to be honest with me. Was this painful? I know it's not a full on production meal, so to speak, but it was a decent snack to keep you guys filled until the next one, right? I know it's a little nugget. You know what I'm saying? Part five, though, is going to be a bang coming out in summer of 2035 to a theater near you. Until next time, wash your hands. Peace.